what we wanted to do today is really take you through resilience as a topic. And the first thing we wanted to do was define what urban resilience is. So we took Rockefeller's Foundation's definition on urban resilience. It's really about the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow, no matter what kind of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. When it comes to chronic stresses, we heard this morning about transport and mobility. Transport is a huge problem, whether you're in emerging markets or in developed cities. Unemployment, water crises, sustainability and pollution. We were just looking at the pollution index this morning, right? Sure. This, is a real, this is a real issue that a lot of cities are facing. There's also acute shocks. And the mayor is going to talk about Christchurch, which many of you might know in 2011, they had one of the worst earthquakes where 90% of the buildings in the downtown area had to be redeveloped afterwards. And this happened in a developed city not too, not too far ago. So these are things that keep up citizens, public leaders, and companies. So how do we address that? When it comes to resilience, I mentioned the earthquake. You know, the picture on the right-hand side in the top right, I was in London two weeks ago, and one of the key issues that's been in the newspapers is around the pollution index. Pollution is a major problem in London, not only in London, but UK cities. A lot of the UK cities are actually past the EU thresholds. And they're either getting fined or they're about to be fined. So it's a real issue. And you would have heard of the Flint, Michigan crisis around water. And what that did in terms of galvanizing the community and water is a basic human right. And people expect to have clean water. And lastly, uh, when it comes to traffic, this is just a data point that I picked up a couple of weeks ago. New York has had and is having the worst congestion. Now, we look at the sharing economy. We look at all the new modes of transport that we have today. Yet, transport infrastructure in a lot of cities is stressed more than ever before. So what we wanted to do today, and the panelists are each have prepared remarks, so we want to set the context and really hear it from the lens of each of their daily jobs and their cities or their projects, and then get into more of a moderated discussion around what are the learnings, what are the opportunities, and where we see opportunities in the future. So, Mayor Dalziel, I wanted to hand it over to you to take us through the experience in Christchurch. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the introduction. So, as uh, Arvind has said, we've got this, we had the earthquake back in 2011, um, but in the context of this part of the forum, uh, we've really emerged from uh, what was a tragedy uh, with far more flexible and resilient city services than we had before. It has been an opportunity to actually build back better. Um, and I always make the point about resilience is that it's a journey, not a destination. And it's something that it's a constant um, aspiring to be better at what you can do, but also taking the definition that was put up. It's about adaptability, and that means it, it's a constant state. It's not um, a destination. Um, and I guess that uh, with disaster, there always comes opportunity, and the opportunity that uh, we've seen uh, comes at a really interesting time in world history where we have this uh, convergence of accelerating global urbanisation and an exponential digital uh, revolution. And, and I thought I'd show you my book that I'm reading at the moment. I'm not a publisher or anything like that, but um, it's called Thank You For Being Late. It's an optimist guide to thriving in the age of accelerations by Thomas L. Friedman. And uh, I haven't finished reading it yet, but it really does pick up on this whole point around the optimism and the capacity for what we are able to achieve um, in this uh, global urbanisation trend uh, coupled with the increased um, uh, digital experience. Now, that's not without its challenges because, of course, infrastructure, 
is very much 20th century, and of course, um, decision making seems to be locked into the 20th century as well. So I think decision making has to move into the 21st century along with um, with the infrastructure. And for me, silos are the biggest barrier to developing flexible and resilient city services. Now, this is my favourite book. It's called If Mayors Ruled the World. Now, that usually gets a bit of a laugh because mayors, um, you know, like the idea of ruling the world. Um, but when I say that, it's um, Benjamin Barber's theme that is contained within the, the book that really uh, is what I want to emphasise here. Dysfunctional nations, rising cities. Disease, climate change, global terrorism, they don't respect country borders. It's only at the city level that we can really take on the challenges and build the level of resilience that will enable communities to um, withstand those. Um, we are seeing a devolution of power to the, um, to the cities, which is so much closer uh, to the action and the ceding of power upwards to global governance structures based on cooperating cities. And we're going to see more of that. Look at the reaction of the major United States cities right. to the United States decision to pull out of the um, Paris Accord, um, an instant response. Cities are not only more pragmatic and grounded um, and participatory than nation states, um, obviously they're much closer uh, to the people. And uh, this is the quote from Benjamin Barber, even as the nation state descends into paralysis and democratic dysfunction, cities are re-emerging as cross-border problem solvers going boldly where states no longer dare to go. go. So we're at an interesting time in world history, escalating urbanisation coupled with an exponential growth in technology. And um, I, I sort of kind of, I like this slide because what it, what it tells us is that there, there is this stage two, the deceptive stage. And um, the deceptive stage is, is, is denial. It's an absolute denial that there is going to be um, the kind of disruption that will come. Now, if stage six is democratisation, then that's a good objective, that's a good thing to achieve, but there is going to be pain along the way. And so I guess my message is that cities need to be ahead of the curve. The Christchurch Smart City Program used a, um, uses a jigsaw approach as a metaphor for um, the way that we are trying to bring the smart city technologies into our city. Um, and there are lots of pieces that fit together to make the final uh, picture, but in the process of building the final product, you've got to be willing to sort of move things around and just see uh, whether they fit. But people have to be at the centre of, of development. Um, and collaborative planning and citizen participation are absolutely uh, core critical. Now, these are just um, the guidelines that our program has picked up on. We're a small city. We're, we're big enough to trial things, and when we trial things, we can, can go to scale if they're, if they're successful. But more importantly, we're small enough to fail, and that means that we can take risks, we can uh, fail fast and try again. Um, the Smart Cities program always set, set, also says, look, we'll shoulder the risk. We'll take some of the risk out of a pretty risk-averse um, environment. Local government can be a bit slow uh, because of that risk aversion. And using trials to iterate, to reach to a solution like a business case on speed, leveraging existing programs and getting on with it. Free and open source is important. The share code, all of our code is published on GitHub and that helps others leverage off the work that we're doing. And of course that mobile first approach does make sure that it's available to all um, who have the, the different technologies available. Now I'm not gonna go through these because I'm probably getting close to time. I um, like the talking rubbish. Yeah, the talking rubbish was uh, was one that I mentioned <laughs> at one of the other sessions. Uh, this was a high profile issue in a small suburb, seaside suburb, where the people basically said, if the council can't get the rubbish right, they're not gonna be able to fix our suburb. So um, we've put in some smart bins there. It's made a, a huge difference. And just 
things. That, that the rubbish remo removal has dramatically reduced. Negative comments on social media have just pretty much been wiped out. Um, the rubbish has gone, and they're 100% seagull proof, which is pretty important um, in, in the beach side. <laughs> but they don't pass the streetscape design test, so we're now looking at sensors that we can put into our own rubbish um, bins and uh, make that sort of uh, connection with our own um, facilities. Um, SnapSend solves a really cool model. Um, the, a citizen can see a pothole on the road, take a picture, uh, send it off to the council. The council sends it off to the appropriate department, it gets fixed. Uh, and that's all based on the GPS system through the phone. So it's a, a really good model. The mobility parking solution's great because it does have a, a matching tag with your mobility um, parking um, facility. It links to a, um, a sensor on the on the mobility park, which means that uh, you, you are definitely entitled to be there, and we know when you're not. So um, it's been a, a great um, uh, facility for that. Uh, Smart Cross is a, you can play a game of Pong while you're waiting to cross the road, right. which is great, great for interaction and um, just great fun. But it's also Wi-Fi enabled, so it has the ability to pass on community messages. So I just want to make the final point, which is that a smart city is a resilient city. So you can't be a resilient city unless you're a smart city, and you can't be a smart city unless you're a resilient city. So. Um, we're very open to new ideas, new ways of doing things. Uh, we regard ourselves now as a place where anything is possible, and that's been the opportunity that we've been given. You'll see us trialling the autonomous shuttle out at our airport and uh, electric vehicle sharing uh, will be coming to Christchurch um, as an alternative to uh, um, the standard cars uh, in the next uh, few months, uh, shared with uh, government agencies and the private sector. Great. I like that, small enough to fail, mm. right? So Rahul, why don't you share your perspectives? <laughs> Absolutely. So I think <coughs> the mayor has uh, teed this up very, very well. I want to touch on just go up about 100,000 foot to talk about resiliency. So why are people talking about resiliency uh, today? And why have they talked about it in the, in the past? And why is it really uh, relevant to urban, urbanization? There are five mega trends that are really affecting us. Um, the demographic shifts is, is critical. We talked about uh, some of the cities, some of the aging uh, population. If you just think in terms of the curb design in a city and what allows you to walk and be ADA friendly, this is one element of resiliency, inclusion. How do you actually deal with, with, with that particular topic? We're talking about technology breakthroughs. Um, you've heard of a lot about data. I like to focus on knowledge. Uh, so leveraging uh, uh, an economist perspective, data, information, intelligence, knowledge. And all of us have a device that gives you instant information. What we are looking for is knowledge. And when we combine our understanding of demographic shifts or the economic shifts or climate change, we can actually leverage those uh, technology breakthroughs. So these five elements of megatrends are both impacting how we are dealing with, in, uh, with each other in cities, but also affecting uh, how cities are uh, dealing with urbanization. Um, we will have more people living in an urban environment than ever before, and about five billion people are gonna live in urban slums. And if you're not ready as a city to take care of housing, water, power, food supply, you can imagine what's going to happen when that rural population moves into your city and completely chokes it. So those mega trends are extremely important. The challenging is driving resilience, and I really appreciated uh, the definition of resilience. What you can see here is many disruptions to the traditional way of doing business. You've got interdependence. You've got a changing world. You've got issues. Uh, that really get to the nub of what businesses are thinking about. Think about a brittle supply chain. If you are doing just-in-time food, just-in-time water, and if your healthcare clinics are not positioned in a polycentric city or they are just in the central business district, all of these challenges 
of basically a design of a city that was not experiencing or not expecting the fundamental change in demographics is going to really impact. So you've got the mega trends on the one hand, and you've got changes in the way business is operating. And the combination of those two things uh, can really cause uh, cities to completely shut down and not being able to deal with when they experience a shock. It may work on a day-to-day -day basis, but if you have climate change in the city of Miami, on a sunny day, you have water coming through uh, the, the, the covers that have uh, flooding the conduits. Why? Because of climate change. Mm -hmm. And if your city was not planning for that, it's going to be an issue. If your city was not really planning for integrated mobility, you're going to spending a lot of time in a manner that you didn't experience or didn't expect to. So when you start looking at interdependence, a changing world, I've put some words here uh, that you can see that give you an example of how the mega trends are affecting day-to-day -day behavior. There's a cost associated with it. And from a user perspective, if you live in a city, you have a chance. Most of us in this room are mobile. Those five billion people in urban slums are not. But those of us who can afford to move will move. But we have to worry about everybody else. Because at the end of the day, for a city to thrive, it has truly to be inclusive. So dealing with those issues, how do you go about it? I think these are the six elements of resilience, the key elements of resilience. I think the mayor touched on some of those. But adaptive capacity is critical. How are you making decisions today, either as a mayor or a town planner, if you're an investor, if you are a real estate developer, are you considering the elements of megatrends? Are you considering the elements of challenging resilience? Do you have the agility to reflect the fact that all of a sudden you have 100,000 immigrants uh, that are refugees that show up? How are you going to deal with that? Are you able to actually provide reliable services? Are you relevant today in attracting talent? Are you building the trust between you and the people that live in your city that are actually creating value? And at the end of the day, is everything that you're doing coherent? Because resilience, it starts with people. Mm -hmm. It really is a matter of policy. It's a matter of design. It's a matter of forecasting. It's really about your understanding of the knowledge. Data is just one point in time. Information gives you two pieces of data. Intelligence allows you to get multiple pieces of data, but to really get the context, you need to get to knowledge. And to get to knowledge, if you incorporate these six elements to the mega trends and to the challenges, your city will be resilient. And multiple studies show that cities that are resilient or companies that are resilient actually provide a better return over time. So, how could you get to resilience? Well, the good news is that developments in technology can really help. Incorporating digital, incorporating the cloud and big data, incorporating software-defined networks, this is behind the scene work that needs to be done in terms of the coherence that's important. So how you use AI, virtual reality, how do you use uh, 3D printing, how do you use uh, remote sensing, how do you use uh, the ability to provide remote uh, diagnostic and healthcare, those are all the elements that cities need to think through. It lowers the cost of operations. It creates more uh, incentives to actually bring in talent. Songdo is a great example of it. Singapore is doing this. Singapore, uh, Hong Kong is doing These are projects uh, that we as a company uh, are, are, are helping around the world. And I think if you think through those elements, you can actually get to resilience. Because it starts with the frame of mind. It's a matter of policy. But I think with the fundamental developments in technology, you can get to the right answer. Thank you. Great. And I appreciate the perspectives there. And we'll come back on kind of the technologies in the future you know, after this. But Haider, tell us a little bit about Iskander and your approach to resilience, but also the services. I mean, you've been in this journey for 10 years now, right? Right. Uh, thanks, Alvin. Uh, first, let me clarify that actually we are not a local government that provides city services, but we are the government agency entrusted upon with the tasks of pro uh, planning, promoting and facilitating the development of this economic region uh, called Iskandar Malaysia. Okay. So 
contrary to initial misperception that we received, we are not actually established to take over the roles of any existing authorities or agencies. But our role is mainly to uh, fill in the gaps and add values uh, on those areas which are not covered by the other authorities and agencies. So um, if you can see, for example, this is one area which we add value, whereby we prepared our comprehensive development plan. So this is the planning role that uh, we actually implemented. Um, and in terms of resilience, you can see one of the things that we look uh, into when preparing the, we call it CDP2 in short, is balanced growth. So in order to be resilient, actually we look at the carrying capacity of the whole region. So rather, we, uh, rather than we overbuild, we actually look at what are the thresholds and the ceilings that actually can be carried by the region. So perhaps that is one area of uh, you know, uh, looking at resiliency. And again, uh, to make the growth balance, we are big actually. If you look at that, that is the map of Iskandar Malaysia. We are about three times the size of Singapore. So because uh, of that size, we look at actually focusing the, the growth and the development within the five, we call it flagship zones, which are nodes or growth centers within Iskandar Malaysia. So, and these uh, flagship zones actually have their own characteristics and strengths. So each one actually uh, focus on their own uh, areas uh, of growth. We actually look at, uh, we, we have nine promoted economic sectors. Because uh, when we plan our growth, we look at what are the economic sectors that can contribute towards that growth. So we don't actually just let any uh, investment come into Iskandar Malaysia, but we only focus on these nine sectors. And each of the flagship zones actually uh, will have their own clustering of these sectors. So they don't compete against each other. So perhaps that's another area of uh, resi resiliency. And how we actually cascade down our master plans to the local councils which actually implement all these plans. Uh, for, this is one example where we have a low carbon uh, society blueprint. So our role is to come up with the master plan, the blueprints, the guidelines, and so on. But we are not the implementing agency. So the local councils are the ones that implement all this. So in this case, uh, we come up with uh, what you call the action plan for each local council. So they, they have their own local, uh, their, their own action plans to implement the blueprint that we have uh, formulated. Again, in terms of res to be resilient, I think we need to look at the future. Uh, recently, uh, end of last year, actually, we formed this futuristic Iskandar Malaysia Advisory Council, we call it. Uh, these are made up of the various players and stakeholders that can help to actually transform Iskandar Malaysia into a smart city. Uh, we have other government agencies. We have the technology companies. Uh, we have uh, universities as well as property developers. So by bringing all these parties together, we hope we can actually uh, chart the direction and shape Iskandar Malaysia in the context of technology and innovation uh, together as a single team, rather than doing everything on their own. So this is also a way for us to remain futuristic. Because uh, you may have uh, the concept of smart city now, but in the future, smart city may be just you know, another old concept. So what are the latest emerging trends and concepts? So this, this is the, uh, the, the guys that actually will, will help to think of the future and to ensure that Iskandar Malaysia remain futuristic. And another thing is the big, big data. So one of the things that we are doing now is actually to establish this uh, Iskandar Malaysia Urban Observatory. So as probably you know, uh, it's about having a single window where you can, get, you can gather and get all the data. Currently in Malaysia, you have to go to various uh, agencies and so on to get 
you know, various data. So the idea here is you can go to just one place where the data are de deposited and not just uh, in terms of storing the data, but also where they are actually analyzed, monitored and assessed and then shared with the, with the public and the stakeholders. In Malaysia also, we have this uh, issue of a mismatch between demand and supply of property. So in order to actually minimize this mismatch, we are trying to come up with what we call property foresight, where we look at uh, analytics, data analytics, to foresee the future in terms of the demand and supply. And hopefully we can actually not come to a situation of oversupply and under demand and, and so on and so forth. And here also we uh, bring together all the various parties uh, the, from the, both the demand side as well as the supply side. And uh, this is basically our goal. Uh, now we have our CDP, our Comprehensive Development Plan. We have our blueprints, guidelines and so on. And in the future, we want to become smart city, we have our urban observatory and so on. But <clears throat> the future will become the present, you know. So how do we remain futuristic? So these are basically the framework that we are working towards. Great. Yep. I like the blueprint and the future advisory council. We can discuss some of the things that you're doing there. Okay. So Devin, over to you. You're going to complete the tri-nations that we have here. We have an Aussie, a Kiwi, and a South African. So we shouldn't be talking about rugby. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to build atop also what, uh, what I presented yesterday. And the role that Whereas Matransport's work plays in building resilience within cities. And in listening to what was presented here, it's very clear that information is really one of the key elements that plays a huge role. And I see a large part of the work that we're doing is trying to get the information out on what is really a majority of our mobility network. Um, you know, when we, when we look at mobility across the emerging markets, as I, as I mentioned before, it's, you're looking at 70 to 80% of it is driven by, by this resource. And what it really made clear to us in our work was that the cities that we're looking at, they're, they're resource rich, but they're information poor. Mm. And how is it that we can help them better grasp or understand the services that are already being rendered within those cities? And also, how do we start to untap or, or tap into the potential that actually exists within? How do we start to help the cities understand these networks and these resources so that they can also start to optimize them? And a huge part of that lay in obviously connecting all of this information together. And this really started with uh, this first project that we did. Uh, it's about November, I think we started in November last year, uh, the first city being Cape Town. And we set out to actually map the entire informal transport network within the city. And uh, we, we landed up with 657 routes uh, and there you get a you get a sense of the sort of topographical layout of of, of the network, um, and for many of us, we're probably more familiar with seeing uh, the transport network of a city presented maybe as a schematic map. If you think about the the London tube map or the likes, so what we did was we 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 wanted people to be able to both uh, visually experience uh, well experience this information both in a visual way as well as an experiential way so if i wanted to go from a to b i'd actually be able to use this information but also for many members of our society who maybe don't look at public transport as a feasible means of movement, also for them to see the potential of this information within their city and start to understand where it goes and so, so in the previous one is that all the different modes uh, in the previous one, that is only the informal network, the informal okay. network alone. And actually, if you could see that in contrast with the formal network, you would understand just how big the contrast is. It's, quite, it. it's quite remarkable. Um, so what we did was we actually simplified this down to what you'd refer to as a schematic map, I guess. Uh, and that schematic map represents 160 routes, roughly. Um, and when you think about the London tube map that has maybe 30 lines on it, mm -hmm. uh, thereabouts, you get a very quick understanding of just how complex these networks are and the fact that these networks have sort of changed uh, and grown organically to match the demand within the city. So, yeah, we produced these, these maps and released them uh, to various members of, of, of the city to, to get them to start to buy in and understand the, the role that this information might play within their city. 
from there, we actually went and we, we started doing this for a number of cities. We, we, the first one afterwards was uh, Gaborone, which is the, the capital of Botswana. And uh, this was actually in response to the World Bank picking up on our, our project and the work that we're doing and saying, well, can you come help us uh, maybe make some quick wins in Gaborone? And uh, that really kicked off by going and mapping the city. And it, it took all of six days. So it's, it's these things are achievable in a really, really short space of time. And that's the amazing aspect that technology also brings to the table. And the way that we'd even go about it is we'd engage the community. So it also it, it, it furthers job creation in those areas. So as opposed to going into these cities ourselves and mapping the networks, rather what we do is we, we say that we're going to launch an initiative in a city, and anyone who wants to join us and aid us in these efforts can download the application, which is a way of qualifying. They have the appropriate device. And then just send us one route, which qualifies sort of their level of technical fluency in utilizing an application. That's so a little bit like Waze. Yes, yes, right. uh, but uh, you know, a lot of people so will sort of contrast or compare our, our work with that of ways and what we try and get people to understand, crowdsourcing side mm -hmm. uh, aside, is the difference between people's decision making when using private transport versus public transport, the real decision making factor lay in the autonomy. And so to get people to go from, let me take my car keys and head out uh, in my vehicle to using public transport. The only thing that you're going to be able to give me that's going to get me to shift over is trust. And you're going to have to be able to allow me to rely on this service because that's the, f that's the whether it's uh, truthful or not, I, I feel like I have autonomy with my car, even if I'm still stuck in traffic and an hour late for the meeting. I feel like I chose that. Or when I'm on the train or the bus or the minibus, I don't feel like it was my, my choice. So how do we start to put this reliability into public transport services, which again comes back to the information. How do we make that information available? So yeah, we went through this effort of mapping, mapping all these various places. And as I said, that information that gets democratized or made available. So for the first time in many of these cities, not just do the city leaders have access to the information, but also all of the citizens. And a number of people grabbed me after, after the presentation yesterday and said, oh, great, how do I download your app? <laughs> and uh, just to clarify, Whereas My Transport is an, is an information platform, an integrated mobility platform. For us, it's rather about creating the information and integrating it and centrally housing it and then making it open and available for others to build. So in the last nine months since launching this, there's actually over 300 companies, large corporates, startups, and independents who started building apps for 20 different cities. I don't actually know what all these apps look like yet or what all their names are, but we can see how people are using the information. Um, we can tell them in the last nine or 10 months, people have made over 40 million calls for the data that we've provided. Again, how it's going to be useful, we're not entirely clear on. But just to, just to wrap up, uh, from a resiliency point, it, it really lay around the information and the power of that data. And what we're trying to do is simply give cities a central platform that is capable of housing all of that information, dealing with the, the reality and the context of the environment and market in which this public transport mobility exists. And then making that information open and democratized, as you can see to the right there, the information that comes up, there's information for cities, whether it's to hold their service providers accountable because they subsidize the, the sector, or for the passengers being able to pull information out of city infrastructure or their mobile device, or for the operators finally giving them a, a, a means of actually communicating with different people no matter where and where they are obtaining that information. So, Mayor Delzio, I'm going to come to you. I mean, Christchurch obviously went through a fairly traumatic period. Um, when you look at resiliency and also building urban infrastructure, how do you measure resiliency in your city today? And also, what are some learnings that you would share with other cities and other leaders out there in terms of the Christchurch experience and how you approach it? I think that your question actually raises an issue that I'm still grappling with, and that is how on earth can you uh, build resilience? How can you take advantage of um, the situation without going through a disaster? Because it seems to me that disaster becomes the driver of change. Right. And although that's uh, a positive that comes out of something that's, that's a tragedy, uh, it does seem to me that it's a, I'd love to know the answer to the question about what would actually encourage cities to take up some of the opportunities um, without waiting for a disaster to occur. Right. 
and some of the um, the knowledge and experience, but also um, that that sort of in depth knowledge which sits in the community. That that's where you'll find the answers. And um, so I'm I'm really convinced that that's something that we need to be doing a lot more on, and that's something that we can learn from our experience. But uh, I guess that in terms of resilience also, it, it's, that, it's that sense of adaptability, it's that sense of how do you bring uh, all of the, um, the different points of view together in order to develop the best opportunities. And that's why we've taken the approach to the Smart Cities program that we have. It's not that there's a one-size-fits-all solution. And it's not that we can just pick something off the shelf and, ad and adopt it. It has to be able to be adapted to the local environment and people being involved in the decision making and making it accessible is absolutely core critical. And that's why I liked the advisory council approach, you know, getting the different parts of industry, academia, the community working hand in glove with government in order to create um, a resilient and flexible city. Makes sense. So Rahul, just building on top of this, what are some examples? Because clearly you've worked on a number of projects, you've seen what's, what works, what doesn't work. What are some examples that you could highlight on this? Yeah, I think uh, the mayor's point is right on. Uh, the first time I got engaged with resiliency was 1993. Uh, after the Alfred Murrah bombing in the city of Oklahoma. And I've been involved with uh, Katrina and Sandy and helping in Haiti uh, with, with, with the knowledge. And I totally agree with you that it's when you get a disaster that uh, either city planners or providers or users starts wor start worrying about what's next, what's the next step. So we break it down. We, 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 we think about what's the people side of it, what's the process side of it, What's the policy side of it? I think getting to your point. So as lessons learned become extremely important. Mm -hmm. If you are a brownfield city, uh, if you don't have the luxury of what Songdo has done or Incheon has done here, um, you need <coughs> to retrofit. You need to think through how you're going to get communications into the system. So uh, for us, uh, on, on a project like uh, when we were advising after uh, Katrina, which was a mer major hurricane in, in, in the city of New Orleans, Louisiana, um, cell on wheels, they were called cows. It's a telecommunications network. So you just drop a system and it creates a telecommunication network. You should have a plan. Mm. If you are a city that has hurricanes, that has flooding, that has earthquakes, you should have a telecom plan when your tower goes down. In the meantime, how are you implementing solar power as part of your tower strategy so that you can keep the network up? That's a simple thing. Um, I really like uh, your comment about providing uh, the local community uh, with the opportunity uh, to participate. So when you have a major hurricane and the entire infrastructure is wiped out, there's no reason to bring ice or water from three cities away. You should have a plan to have the local community basically provide those services because to recover and to reconstitute means that the local community has to be the one who does this. They have to be the ones who actually trust the system to, to bring it together. So on our projects, we actually bring um, the, the private sector, companies like Walmart and Home Depot and, and, and Target, um, so that they have a plan to supply the local community with the tools after the event. We actually create a supply and demand or a bid board. You can sell ice, you can sell water, you can sell food. Those are things that can happen today. Um, coming on the heels of, of Katrina, uh, at least in the United States, I'm based out of Washington, DC, we created something called the National Information Exchange Model called NEEM. It, it basically allows you to take existing resources and redeploy them for other purposes. Mm. So a school bus that only operates, just like the car, we talked about smart mobility, only operates maybe three hours a day every day, Monday through Friday, can be used to redeploy resources, can be used as a way to actually move refugees out, to actually clear out the cities into safer areas. Those are the kind of activities, understanding what your products are, where your services are, and how they can be redeployed. Those are resilient activities. It's building the trust, it's creating the agility, it's creating the adaptation, uh, the capacity building. But most importantly, 
Um, I think it's the fact that you are learning from past disasters. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Because how many of you are ready for a seven day in your house today with no food, no access to food other than what you have, no access to water other than you have, if I cut off your water and cut off your electricity, cut off your food? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't worry about it. But a brittle supply chain in a city for food can absolutely destroy the city. You'll have a run, you'll have uh, chaos, you have people going to ATMs when ATMs run. So we have gotten to a point where we take everything for granted, but resilience, that's why I said, it's really policy, it starts with the person. You have to think through it, and I think there's an opportunity to leverage the technology, leverage the knowledge to, to bring that. So Katrina, New Orleans has gone through examples of how to deal with the water issues. Mm -hmm. Miami is dealing with the flooding. Uh, New York City learned on how to store and redeploy uh, the supply chain for fuel because if you have no po power, you cannot use the, the pumps to actually resupply ambulances and fire and police. So these are examples of where we have thought through the single point failure so you don't get cascades and we have deployed those kind of lessons learned. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was reading, there was a team in Oregon that actually came in and started doing some of the mapping initially after the Haiti earthquake happened. So when it comes to resiliency, one of the questions I had was, does it have to be done locally? Because if the infrastructure goes down, today you might have the ability to provide some of this remotely yeah. in other cities mm -hmm. because the city in itself might just have no capability yeah, at that a time. Real quick example. So my team worked out of uh, Washington, D.C. to try to address the issue of cholera in, in Haiti. Um, and what we did was we, re we deployed very cheap SMS phones and we used the power of uh, uh, GIS to identify uh, the hydrology and the topology and the topography of where cholera was happening. So the metric was how quickly can you give uh, the vaccine, which is a great metric, right? But what if the metric was how do you make sure that people don't get infected? Okay. So the way water flows is just as important in that understanding and knowledge. And we did all that work for very low cost remotely, wow. understanding the data points. And we made the villages resilient and we taught the village elders on how to worry about the startup of something like cholera, and that was very different. For them, it was extremely educational because for the first time, they didn't worry about when I get a vaccine. They actually knew what to do so they can avoid the propagation of a disease. Got it. You know, the common theme that I see in both yours is a question, which is how do you build resiliency without going through a traumatic event, mm. right? Because if you're in most cities, unfortunately, they haven't gone through and hopefully they won't go, go through these traumatic events. But how do you actually build that infrastructure and the flexibility? And I think that's, that's an interesting learning and they should learn from your experience and the other ones that have happened in the past. But it's also a state of mind. And uh, just picking up on the Katrina um, issue and your mentioning of Walmart, because Walmart proved itself to be a genuinely resilient organization and was actually a kind of a rock star of the response. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the chief executive, the head of Walmart, contacted the managers uh, in all of the Walmart stores that in the affected areas and said, you're going to be called upon to make decisions that are way outside your sphere of um, delegation. Uh, talk to the right people and make the right decisions. Right. So they, they had their back. And that, to me, is a resilient organisation that was able to translate its own resilience into support for the whole city. Absolutely. Now, Hydeer, so when you look at kind of these learnings and some of the advisory efforts that you're going through, what are you thinking about in terms of building some of this capability for the future in Iskander? And, and also, what's some of the, the policy decisions that you're looking at into the future? Right. Um, you mentioned about it's been 10 years now uh, from the start of Skadar Malaysia. If you look at the property industry, 10 years actually represents one cycle. Mm. Uh, if you compare the values of properties uh, before and after, I think you wish that you had uh, invested in a lot of properties in Skadar Malaysia. I think for a new city, that is a characteristic that you have to take into account. Uh, but I'm not talking about the normal, your typical investors and so on, but 
the local communities, how they can become economically resilient is by actually having them uh, to benefit from all this economic growth and so on. Now, when I first uh, joined uh, Iskandar Malaysia, I was tasked with coming up with this social uh, wealth sharing model, which I did actually formulated, which I call the social real estate model, uh, which is basically to uh, you know, empower the local communities to uh, invest in properties and benefit from the appreciation in values of properties. So I'm looking from the economic resilience rather than you know disasters and so on. Uh, unfortunately, it was not fully implemented, but this is one area which probably in hindsight uh, we could have done better. Um, whereby now you can see the the values of properties have folded many times, but properties will keep on you know appreciate in values. So there's still time for the local communities to be able to uh, to be to be able to benefit and you know uh, position themselves in uh, in the cycle of the economic growth and also the property market. Got it. Makes sense. So, Devin, when you look at cities, so let's take Cape Town. Prior to you getting engaged, there's this informal network which the city didn't really know about. Riders didn't have visibility to. So what's been the before and after impact? I think it's too soon to speak about the after impact. Mm -hmm. um, but what has been an interesting response from the city and the, the mobility ecosystem as we see it, from, from the city side, there's been an immediate engagement around the information, almost like a thirst for this information and how they can start to work with it. Uh, I had a very interesting conversation with our mayor who looked at this and went, well, I understand that this is not going to be the panacea, right? It's not going to make everything right within our city. But I do want to understand where the pain points are. I do want to understand where people are struggling. I want to understand where they're facing three-hour daily commutes. Um, I, I need this information before I can start to fix anything. Um, from the mobility uh, providers themselves, it was very interesting to see how many of them, you know, they, they provide a service in their, in their limited corridor. But for them to actually see the full network and understand, wow, this is, this is where the rest of my colleagues are operating. This is where they're servicing other communities. Um, there was a feeling of, worth would be the wrong word, but um, their value to the city and the role that they play and just how big that role was, that wasn't actually clear or visible. You know, I was in Cape Town last year and I used Uber and I heard the Uber session this morning and you know, we were chatting about this yesterday. Uber pool just does not work in South Africa, right? Because of security and those issues. Uh, I'm curious in terms of the sharing economy and the impact that you're seeing, wh what's your perspective as to how that's going to either add stress or alleviate stress from transport infrastructure? So I think there's two sides to the sharing economy that and there's something that's maybe unique to the market in which we're operating and this also draws on the economic side. So the private vehicle within our market is still a symbol of freedom and it's a symbol of mm. Um, mm. you know increasing wealth. Mm. And until that perception shifts, people will continue to want to own vehicles, not share them, right? Um, or share services, should I say. And so what we're still seeing within these emerging cities is a rapidly increasing rate of private vehicle ownership, which is really one of the major challenges. So on top of rapidly growing uh, rates of urbanization within these, these cities, uh, you also have increasing private vehicle ownership. And so how do we start to shift people's perception around private vehicle ownership to one of being able to utilize these public services or these shared services? And a huge amount of this stems or sits around trust and being able to trust and rely on these services. And this is where from a Whereas My Transport standpoint, we see information as this catalyst to be able to shift this public perception. Makes sense. Um, so I'm going to come back. I, I want to leave some time for questions, but you know, la last question that I have for each of the panelists. I mean, we talked about technology, we talked about the future and some of the exciting stuff. You said the future is really exciting. Mm -hmm. what, what excites you? And maybe just highlight a service or services in, in the city that could really benefit from this. 
Well, I'm thinking, you know, from the perspective of being a, the city's mayor, is that there is a sense of, um, you know, disquiet if the if the council's not able to deliver services um, promptly and efficiently and and well, and um, and using the example of the of the rubbish bins, you know, it just, it it just you know it it it's made such a huge difference in terms of just how people feel about it, and people feel good about the council and the services that they're able to deliver and then feel that they can partner with the council in terms of their own communities and that they can input themselves. And that's where I think technology offers a huge amount of opportunity because no more do we really need to be thinking about um, electing somebody to make all the decisions for you. In fact, we can have instant communication right across our communities and have real-time feedback on issues um, that relate to individual communities. So uh, I, I, I see a great future for the way technology not only enables communities to um, interact and do things for themselves, but also how they can actually directly input into decision-making. Will that, make governance, will that make governance easier or harder? I think it will make governance more challenging, but mm. more worthwhile. Fantastic. Uh, Rahul? I think for the first time, um, we are going to create an environment where each person has a relationship with the city that they live in. Mm. You will have instant understanding of your impact on the city, and you'll have an understanding of what the city is doing to you. Mm. Everything from how much water you're using, how much power you're using, what your carbon footprint is, what your neighbors cut for, and how much you're walking. And I think to me, um, uh, we are explorers. Uh, our, our, our gene pool is about knowing what's on the other side of the hill. We want to go to Mars, we want to go to other places. But for the first time, I think we will have a very open relationship. And I think it'll be a challenge, uh, but I think it's good because uh, with seven billion people on a planet, if you believe the J curve or the S curve, we already exceeded the carrying capacity of the planet. I think technology will really help and allow us to then choose how resilient do we choose to be and what we want to do to each other or to the planet itself. Right. And I think to me it's exciting that technology is going to allow that conversation and hopefully that leads to much better decision making. And it also kind of comes back to your point on climate change and the role that cities have, right? Because if you have that loop mm. between citizens and the cities to provide better services or energy efficient, et cetera, it makes sense. Now, Hydra. Yeah, um, you can see from my earlier slides that big data analytics will enable us to become more resilient because uh, in the example that I showed, uh, in the pro property market, actually, we are looking at how to f uh, foresee the future trends in terms of demand and supply of properties. And instead of having the current issues of mismatch of this demand and supply, we hope we can actually match demand and supply, not just in terms of the numbers, volumes and so on, but also in terms of pricing and location, where we actually come up with the supply of the properties uh, to match the demand. Uh, but it's not just all about properties. Uh, our urban observatory will actually cover, you know, even the environment side, the social side and so on and so forth. So with big data analytics, we hope that, you know, we will be able to achieve our vision and make us more resilient. Great. Now, Devin, is flying cars in your future analysis? <laughs> <laughs> flying buses. No. Flying buses. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> no. um, yeah, in, in terms of things that I look forward to in the future with my sort of mobility hat on, I look forward to a day when I can take my phone out and finally do the Cape to Cairo trip, uh, understanding all the options that are available to me. That's kind of my, when, when, when that works, I'll hang it up and we're, we're done. But <laughs> with my technologist hat on, the thing that I really look forward to is better frameworks around the democratizing and the opening of information. The amount of people that I know that would love to have an impact, that would like to really get involved and make a difference within their cities or within their economies, or within a particular sector, but don't have a way of accessing the necessary information. I think once we come up with a better transaction model for this data also between not just the, the public sector, but also the private sector, um, the ability for impact to be occurring on many more fronts will truly be become available to us. Great. 
So I wanted to um, take two questions from the audience. Please, if we can just get a mic out front. My name is Abdul Tawab Yusufzai. Uh, I'm from Kabul New City and Barikab Economic Zone. Uh, what I understand from the panel, uh, one of the main factors of making cities resilient is disaster and risk management of the city. Afghanistan is the fourth country uh, which is impacted by climate change all in all over the world. So in last March, we had three times flash flood and in, in west of Afghanistan. And 20% of our beautiful city has been demolished. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to have your idea and your experience that how to cope with this, these issues. Thank you. Rahul, you, you might be, you work in the region. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, world peace is next. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think this is extremely complex, right? So climate change, um, as we can see, is an emotional topic as well as a data-rich topic. Um, for cities to deal with flooding, uh, the Mississippi River in the United States floods regularly. You have floods in Bangladesh regularly. Uh, I think there's been flooding in Taiwan this week uh, because of typhoons. Um, Stormwater management and water management is absolutely critical. Um, but when I say it's absolutely critical, everybody understands that. The plan to actually capture the water and store it and clean it and release it for multiple purposes is both uh, 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 an exercise in imagining what you could do in the area, but also leveraging te technology. For example, the city of Chicago has built uh, a, a, sh a shaft that goes straight down. It's almost, uh, I, I want to say, three quarters of a mile deep and uh, the city of Chicago reversed the flow of the Chicago River, so instead of going into the Lake Michigan, it goes the other way. Because of flooding and dealing with the issues associated with water management. But it took decades for everybody to agree. And, and I think consensus building around water, power, food, healthcare, really starts with um, a, a master plan and architecture for the city. In terms of rebuilding, I think uh, I, would, I would defer to Haider because um, I think there's a huge amount of money sitting on the sideline uh, waiting to be put against real estate and development projects. Um, and, and a smart project, a smart city, a smart infrastructure uh, building that's automated, um, it's going to happen when you reduce the risk associated with that investment. And I think, I think that's probably the hardest part, specifically for Afghanistan. Having spent 15 years in the US government, I can tell you that um, from my experience, a lot of this international money is not going to show up unless some of the risk associated with it. But certainly, water uh, can be addressed uh, in a manner that is much more consistent with the leading practices around the world. Absolutely. I don't know if that answers it, but it's an idea on how to get started. We'll take one more question, please. Hi, my name's Mark Thomas from the principal island of New Zealand, the North Island, um, <laughs> but I'm living in Singapore now, <laughs> one of the principal islands in uh, Asia, of course. Look, I know we've touched on this, but I wonder if I could ask each of you to briefly summarise what you think the major impediment is to you making your cities or your regions or your products um, smarter uh, and so more able to achieve the flexibility and the res resilience. What's the one thing uh, that's holding you back or your city back or your business back from the next big step? We'll yeah, well, from a government point of view, it's risk aversion. That is the greatest uh, barrier that I think our city faces and any city faces because everyone wants to uh, take credit for success. Nobody wants to take responsibility when things go wrong. But for every innovation that we have seen of substance in the world, there were failures that led to that success. So you've got to be prepared to fail. So I guess that's my single biggest message um, and why I say Christchurch is small enough to fail, but um, good enough to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> 
the, I, I would say it's the speed at which technology is changing mm. is a hundred times faster than the ability to make decisions about it. So the one thing that's holding up is the disconnect between the business and the public sector being able to make a decision. And by the time you make a decision, that technology or that process has changed. And, and that disconnect is very, obviously very disruptive, but we are actually moving faster than our structures and rules, regulations, and frameworks mm. are able to catch up. Which is probably why some of this technology is testing the rules and structures and frameworks. Yeah, so right. autonomous car, I, I sat in an autonomous pod in 2004 and it did everything. I have a semi-autonomous car today, but it is not going to result in what we want because you have to change so many laws and so many processes. So I think that disconnect is a significant issue and I'm not sure how we address it. But that's another issue too, um, stranded assets. So, and that's an issue for a city that owns uh, so much of its infrastructure. Right. When technology does uh, potentially create leapfrog um, um, uh, potential, okay. you know, then, then you're going to see, uh, you know, Large energy portfolio. distribution, yeah. for example. La yeah, and um, assets, yes. yeah, it's a, it's a real issue. Hyder. Yes, uh, in our case, it's actually to change the mindset of our key stakeholders because not everyone are as forward looking. Um, so we have to do a lot or to get a lot of buy-ins uh, from the, those who actually implement all these uh, plans and, and so on. Great, Devin? I uh, feel the mayor's point in terms of the risk aversion, trying to, I mean, a, a large part of our work is engaging with the city governments and the process through which we have to go through to get access to the information just to show a proof of concept is a huge barrier to entry and sometimes causes delays of 18 months, which is untenable when you're a, when you're a startup. So great question to end on, thank you. So please give the panelists a big round of applause. Really appreciate the perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.